<laughs> well, welcome everybody on this gray and wet day, made beautiful though by the lovely four colors. Uh, before I do the introduction, I would like to do something important that you will all understand, and that is to take the time to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And I'd also wish to acknowledge that many of you are joining us today from many different places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands too. Um, I'm not going to uh, say very much about myself except to say that my field is architectural and I suppose wider social history and I'm still actually working, which is good, hoping to finish a reassessment of Arthur Erickson's uh, architecture and ideas. Much more important than me is to introduce Professor Carol Herbert, who you all know, I think, um, and to congratulate her on recently being appointed Order of Canada, the winner um, of the Queen's Jubilee Medal, Chair of Family Practice at UBC after a distinguished career in family practice before that, Dean of Medicine at uh, Western from 1999 to uh, 2013, co-founder of UBC's Institute of Health Promotion, president of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, and author, as I'm very glad to say, and many of you will also have read, of numerous inspiring, highly informative and enlightening talks and publications on reconstituting medical training practice and healthcare policy in Canada and further uh, away, Move, uh, moving in the direction of trying to create equitable, if I may put words in your mouth, Carol, uh, and empathetic provision of healthcare. I really enjoyed reading your publications and I assure you I'm not gonna say very much more except to say that I think we talked about uh, using titles or phrases from the titles of three uh, of your publications, which I think really help us to set you telling us about your experience and your insights. So I'm just here to prompt you. So the first one of those is a, a, a really fascinating uh, a talk, um, The Power of Stories. And I want to encourage you to tell us your story, as it were, beginning in Drumheller. And would you allow me just one last aside? I spent uh, a few happy days at Drumheller with my children going to the dinosaur uh, site and museum and actually enjoying a rather amiable embrace of Jessica, a boa constrictor in the uh, reptile refuge at <laughs> Drumheller. Anyway, over to you. Well, thanks very much, Rodri. And, and uh, again, I, it's a pleasure for me to see so many people I know in this audience. Uh, I have to be careful what I say because many of you were there for some of the events and uh, will be able to correct if I, if I uh, say anything uh, untoward, uh, I'm sure. Um, the, the question of stories is an interesting one. I, I believe very strongly in narrative and, and in the importance of narrative I have for, for a long time. Uh, it's now become quite popular actually in medical education to to teach about narrative and to encourage people to, uh, to uh, study narratives and so on uh, in a way that uh, perhaps wasn't so uh, a number of years ago. And for many of you from the social sciences, of course, this is uh, the arts, this is, uh, this is a given. But, um, but I'm, I'm gonna start my own story by situating this in a conversation that I had many years ago in the late eighties uh, when we first went up to Haida Gwaii where I did some uh, ongoing research over a number of years on um, diabetes in, uh, in First Nations uh, in partnership uh, with, with the Haida Gwaii people. And we'll talk about that later, I think, in the conversation. But at that first meeting, when we were just trying to decide what topic would be the topic to go into a grant uh, opportunity, one of the first community-based grant opportunities, uh, uh, and we'd come from UBC, a number of us, and there were people from the community and there were community doctors. And, and one of the uh, uh, elders uh, in, the, in the room as we began to introduce ourselves said, well, but who are you? You know, what you do is you're a professor, but who are you? If we don't know who you are, how can we know whether to believe you or not when you speak? 
Uh, this became actually very, very relevant when we even looked at the question of, of ownership of audio tapes and of, of uh, materials that we gathered, uh, because again, you know, the, the uh, idea within the academy, Michael, you talked about the, you know, the, the issues of the academy. In the academy, uh, anonymity is something that we, we value. If, you, if you're collecting data, you're supposed to anonymize it so that people aren't going to be identified and so on and so on. Well, in many communities, that is antithetical to their cultural beliefs that, that again, if I don't know who the speaker is, how can I know whether to believe what's being said? Uh, and so in the context of, again, as a uh, relatively young professor at the time, I mean, uh, needing to say, well, you know, I'm from British Columbia, I was born in British Columbia, you know, my people came in the following way, uh, that, that, was, that was important in forming relationships. So in, this, in the service of forming a relationship today, I will tell you that um, I've had the privilege of being born and, and living in British Columbia, except for periods of time when I've gone away for working or education. Uh, and uh, I, I, I value that very much. Uh, my family are the beneficiaries of Canada as a, uh, uh, a country of refuge. My, um, my uh, father came as a small boy, uh, a four-year-old uh, with his uh, family from Russia uh, from what is now the Ukraine, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, settled uh, uh, the family settled in Winnipeg, and then later he went to University of Saskatchewan and ended up in Drumheller, which is in fact where the married family uh, settled uh, began. My mother's family, uh, my mother was actually born in Seattle, so she's uh, she was uh, already um, uh, second generation, but her parents came from Turkey and the island of Rhodes and uh, settled in Seattle, met there. And, uh, and then my dad and my mother met uh, in, uh, in Seattle. Uh, he had come down at a time when there were no roads. The highway, I think, was from, from Alberta. And you came through Spokane. And, uh, and he met this, this glamorous young woman who was a concert pianist, the oldest of seven children, uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a family where um, uh, the idea that she then fell in love with and married this guy from Canada, from the wilds of Canada, and went back to Drumheller, which at the time had, had uh, you know, unpaved roads and, and boardwalks. And uh, uh, this, was, uh, this was quite something at the time. And uh, in, the, in the 30s, I think that uh, certainly uh, the, the divide between Canada and the U.S., uh, the, the lack of knowledge was, was considerable. But I was blessed with having this very multicultural background uh, and um, a strong Jewish identity, uh, which uh, to this day is, uh, forms the basis of the values that I have uh, lived by and, and uh, led my career by. And you know, the, the title that I, I chose for the sort of working title is uh, 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 Making a Difference. Um, uh, I think that uh, uh, from the time I was a small child, as one of four girls in our family, uh, four daughters, we um, we were. It was made clear to us early on that the expectation was we would contribute. We would do do things in the world to make the world a better place. Didn't matter in what way or where, but the expectation was we would, and that there was that expectation of of being responsible to give back for all that we had received. Because um, long before people were talking about privilege, I think my family recognized that they were very fortunate to be able to be where they were, and, and we were fortunate, and that although we, we might be successful in, in, because of our own uh, activities, the fact is we were fortunate. So that's the, the, the sort of grounding of the story, and uh, as I say, I've, I've, I lived my whole life uh, uh, in Canada and uh, have been fortunate to travel all over the world, but have uh, been uh, blessed to practice and um, and live here. But you were, you you had a remarkable um, career at school because I think you graduated at the age of fifteen, didn't you, Carol? And then well, I, yes, I did. Uh, in in those days, the uh, there was um, uh, people were skipped. Uh, you skip grades, could skip grades, and I finished high school uh, in three years. So. Yeah, I finished my high school at 15 and went off to UBC. I had just, I got my driver's license on my 16th birthday, which was just before 
a school began and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, the, there wasn't a question of going away because I really wasn't old enough to live away at that point. But uh, uh, we're fortunate to have UBC in the community and, and uh, to, be, uh, to be able to go there for my undergraduate degree and again then for my, for my MD as well. Well, that's interesting. I mean, what about the transition from school into university at that age? I mean, I think UBC tries to really help people who are much younger coming, uh, who, who advance very quickly. That's it, quite it, a leap, isn't it? Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, at the time, you know, back in the day, I mean, at the time, I didn't think much of it. Uh, I actually thought I was quite adult, as you know, most of our children do when they're in their late teens. Uh, 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 and uh, I, I certainly um, uh, didn't have difficulty uh, socially, but uh, you know that was I think that's really the place where people often have difficulty. Many people who've gone through accelerated programs we know have had uh, difficulty with uh, with that uh, aspect of it. Academically it was not the issue, uh, but um, but again I was living at home. I mean I had you know I had strict strict rules in terms of of making sure I was safe. Uh, I think that's probably the main thing when you're very young, you're going off to, to university, much more challenging if you're living away at that point. But um, yeah, it's very I interesting. Think, I mean, you, you began in biochemistry, didn't you, if I remember rightly? Um, I did. And, then, then, and so how, tell us more about your move into medicine, because you well, moved that, in pretty quickly, didn't you? Yeah, in, in, the, uh, in the, the, the years when I was uh, a young adolescent and in uh, junior high and then high school, uh, you'll recall it was the Sputnik era, and certainly those of us who were good at science and math were very much encouraged to uh, to go into the sciences. And this was, you know, this was um, um, this was certainly a, a, a directive. On the other hand, as a as a girl at the time, uh, with the uh, suggestions that were made by career counseling were not necessarily consistent with what we would do now. And, um, but I, I can recall a, a very uh, important time was when uh, Pat McGeer came to my high school, McGee. And Pat McGeer and Edith were at that point in their, in their prime in terms of their science uh, careers at UBC. And Pat talked about um, being a research scientist, being a physician, being a scientist. And, and that was inspiring. And it, it really did actually impact in terms of opening up that possibility of um, you know what what one could do uh, in terms of blending um, sciences humanities. Um, I mean, I I think that uh, only latterly did I realize um, how much of a generalist I am, and that's important because I I think that um, what I recognized as I was moving through uh, that period of sort of deciding on career was that I really did like it all. I liked. You know, I liked what I did. I was fairly successful at what I was doing. And, and so how do you choose a career path? Well, the thing about medicine was that it felt like it was a way of blending all of these various ways of knowing, of thinking about the world, and, and at the same time, a pretty clear direction to how you could contribute, to how you could make things better. And, and, and certainly, I was very idealistic, as most of our medical students are. Frankly, when they come in, uh, when they, they they approach a career path, think um, that when people say they really want to help other people, I think they mean it. Uh, and uh, you know, it's it's our challenge when we're educators to try and retain that idealism and help them to channel it, and not lose the that kind of passion and vision. Mm. Well, was it true that family practice was sort of at the lower end of the totem pole in? in terms of how you were sort of introduced to the profession? Well, certainly in the 1960s, when I was going to uh, medical school, uh, the late 60s, um, it was absolutely true that, again, if you were, if you were good at uh, the uh, academically, if you did well academically, then the, um, the unspoken curriculum, the, uh, what people were, would say sort of off the record was, oh, you shouldn't just be a family doctor. You should be a specialist, you should go and do this or that or the next thing. And, uh, and we didn't see much in the way of role models in terms of family medicine. And so, um, you know, uh, um, I would like to say that I knew my direction from the beginning and I sort of moved for it linearly and, you know, in, in a constant uh, upwards direction or something. But, but that's not how the world works. That's not how life works. And in fact, 
I ended up in, in family practice to some degree accidentally. Uh, I was uh, training, I was doing pediatrics, I was um, uh, heading for a child psychiatry uh, program. But in, in the midst of that, I had my first child and, and I have three birth children and I have three stepchildren. So I've had a large family, but the, the, in those days that I had a little baby uh, and I was a resident and I was trying to balance the thing. And I thought, well, you know, I'd taken some time and I'd done locums and I'd loved practice. I'd loved doing the, what was then called general practice. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe this is something that may be um, a place for me. And I, I, went to work uh, at a place called REACH, which is a community health center still existing more than 50 years later on Commercial Drive. Uh, it was the, one of the first of the community health centers in Canada, uh, which had very innovative programs in the day. And, um, and I started practice there thinking that I would go back and specialize, but fell in love with practice, with community-based settings and uh, and I think matured in my own sort of sense of, of where I could make the best contribution. I did recognize that I was a generalist. I mean, I am somebody who looks at things quite broadly and I'm comfortable uh, with not knowing everything. I'm comfortable with uncertainty. I can make decisions in the face of uncertainty, all of which are things that are necessary uh, as some of the people on, on this call will, will, will testify if you're going to do family medicine, if you're going to do family practice, because we see um, uh, disease and illness at a stage when it's just evolving and when it's still a puzzle. And, and, and so to the degree that you're a person that can, can, can revel in the idea of solving complex puzzles and, and letting things kind of unfold over time, uh, that's a place that just became more and more evident as the place for me. Uh, Reach was an interesting experience because, as I said, at the time, it was extremely innovative. It was a, a place where we had team-based care uh, from, you know, from uh, 1970 uh, when we had nurse practitioners before there were nurse practitioners. We trained nurses to do uh, extended practice and so on. And, and, uh, uh, and we provided a... Um, a model of care that was very much shared decision-making uh, with patients. Uh, we had a community board uh, and, um, and the fascinating thing, of course, looking back on it, and, and I had the privilege of giving a, a talk at the 40th anniversary and then at the 50th anniversary, somebody said, well, you know, did you know when you started what it was going to be like 40 or 50 years later? Well, we sure weren't thinking in 1970, 1975 about 40 years later or 50 years later. Uh, but, but I think the model was, was robust enough that what's exciting is that it has sustained, it's evolved and it's had its ups and downs, but, but fundamentally this notion that you could provide a more egalitarian workplace, you could provide a, uh, a different way of, of, of offering care uh, was, um, has proven to be uh, a, a, a useful and important. The fascinating, thing um, and troubling thing is that it's, uh, you know, 50 years later, they're still debating, uh, you know, uh, models of care that where in fact, um, uh, we know that, that there are some things that just work really, really well, and you can do them in, in different ways than we've done them historically. And um, at the time, though, in, in when I was training, and I went to work at REACH, uh, at, uh, just out of my, uh, my um, postgraduate training, uh, we had been warned, we were warned when I was an intern at St. Paul's Hospital to avoid this place on Commercial Drive that had started up, which was seen to be uh, the thin edge of the wedge. It was a commie pinko front where doctors were being paid uh, salaries. And, uh, and in fact, the first doctors who worked there uh, were uh, providing fee for, they, they were seeing patients and receiving money and fee for service in the usual way, but they were donating their, their, their earnings to run the operation. And, uh, and this was seen as quite suspicious at the time. So, so, uh, um, um, we were experimenting with a lot of things, some of which remain, uh, uh, still, uh, people are debating. And yet we proved, I think a long time ago that they were a good way to to provide care in a which allowed for more creativity uh, and uh, individualization of care than is possible for many people who are practicing in the business model, which is the norm. 
where it's very, very difficult for, for people to, um, to do some of the things we were able to do. Well, no, I was fascinated. I mean, I've sort of put that under the heading of another one of the titles you had. It's a matter of values. And I, I want to get you to talk more about that experience, you know, moving from St. Paul's and so on, and uh, dealing with, because uh, we talked earlier, didn't we, that uh, to some degree, it's really interesting. You've always been a proponent of remembering the importance of nurses, as well as understanding that health is about community and social conditions, uh, as well as the individual, and that it's not just a matter of the science of the body, but the whole person. Well, it's interesting, you know, when you think about how do we make doctors and how do you bring people in? What, what, what should admissions policies be? What do we do in order to socialize people or acculturate them so that they're going to be good physicians when they finish? And, and um, um, you know, I'm an academic and, and I, I like to believe that what we do, uh, all of the work we put into curriculum and, and so on uh, is important and it is, but, but I'm more and more convinced that character and early experience and life choices and demonstrable work uh, uh, ways of approaching uh, problem solving and so on are a much better predictor of what people are going to do and who they will be uh, than, uh, than your score on, a, on an admissions exam. Uh, and you know, I've worked in, in many different settings in terms of medical education, I'm currently involved with a, an international medical school where we see people who didn't make it on the MCAT, couldn't get the high enough score, but they become excellent doctors. They've got very strong motivation. And you know, as long as they're able to, to master the material from an academic point of view, there are other things that are equally and more important. I think that my experience as a, as a kid uh, in a family with a very strong strong social values and a very strong uh, uh, community ethic, uh, ethic of service, um, what uh, in, um, in um, Hebrew is called tikkun olom, the idea of repair of the world is fundamental and the idea that we're all responsible to try and make the world better. Uh, this was a, just a, a core value. And I, I was fortunate enough to have experiences as a, as a young adolescent uh, uh, in, in, uh, you know, in terms of um, youth groups and, and so on, which, which are important, which actually were character forming. I mean, they made a difference. And then I, I had travel experiences. I had a, a, a very important uh, life experience when I was a World University Service Scholar uh, when I was in um, uh, first year uh, sciences at UBC, fortunate to be able to go to Turkey. And I spent six weeks uh, in Turkey uh, studying um, a whole range of things. Uh, and um, among other things, uh, had the experience of, um, you know, looking at medical care and seeing illnesses I wouldn't have seen here and so on, and getting very excited about the idea of going and, again, saving the world, going and doing work abroad, uh, and, uh, uh, and had the opportunity the following year to, I had two choices. One was to go back and work for the Population Health Council and inserting IUDs into third world women. And remember, I started school very young. I'm now about 20 at this point. Uh, uh, I turned 20 in Turkey. Uh, and, and at the same time, uh, uh, realizing something was just not comfortable about, about that direction. Um, and I went instead, uh, did a summer school in, in frontier medicine in um, Inuvik and uh, Fort Ray in, in uh, our uh, Northwest Territories at the time, and had these uh, life-changing experiences of, you know, a first birth, for example, uh, first birth that I attended, uh, Michael, you'll smile at this, uh, Michael Klein, first birth that I, I attended, um, um, I said to the uh, First Nations woman who came into the clinic, um, do you want to lie down in the, on the table over there? And she just looked at me, grunted and said, no, uh, squatted and gave birth to her fourth child, which she handed to me. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that was my first uh, delivery, right? Uh, first attendance at a birth. And um, my experience in the North was, you know, realizing again, at, at a pretty tender age, realizing that there were, um, uh, the, the churches that were located in the in the Northwest Territories were um, being supported uh, from uh, donations abroad. I mean, there was a, a, somebody, some church in Belgium 
was collecting Sunday donations to send missionaries to our north to convert First Nations people. And, and there was just, you know, it was, it was um, consciousness raising is putting it mildly. I mean, I really had a serious rethink about who I was in the world. Uh, it was a very important thing. And out of that, I certainly uh, made decisions about, you know, what I would or wouldn't do. And then again, working at REACH, working in, in, the, in uh, East Vancouver, um, uh, beginning to understand um, different ways of working with people that I certainly didn't learn in, in, in my medical school experience at the time, um, including the, the burgeoning women's health movement. I mean, most of what I used in practice in terms of women's health care I would have to say I did not learn in medical school. I learned through the Women's Health Collective, uh, early uh, community-based work around uh, family violence and, and uh, sexual assault and, uh, and so on. Now, fast forward, I mean, when I became, you know, in a position to affect curriculum as a department chair and then later as a dean, I mean, one of the things that uh, remains very important to me is ensuring that we're in fact responding to the realities of what are the needs in the community and allowing people to, to learn what they need to learn, not just the content knowledge, but the process knowledge. How do you work with people? How do you work with communities? How do you decide what your role is? I mean, our role is as knowledge brokers and as assists for people to make their own health decisions is, is a fundamental position statement, quite different from I tell you what to do because I'm the doctor and you do what you're told. I mean, which in some ways was the still the model in the 60s. I'd like to believe it's no longer the norm. Uh, we do have different ways of working with our students. Yes, I mean, say some more about, uh, let's call it participatory. I mean, I've always admired the Jewish tradition because it doesn't really believe in mission and trying to persuade people that uh, you have the right message as it were. And I think it's very interesting you're talking about not so much a matter of imposition, but a, a kind of a collaboration of participation in understanding about health. So again, the, the working with, um, with people in a collaborative way, uh, what, what I came to understand to be participatory research uh, uh, at, from my scholarly work and, and collaborative decision-making in terms of my medical uh, care um, just made more and more sense uh, as I learned about uh, human behavior. And, uh, you know, again, I'm looking at Ken Craig. I mean, some of the early work, certainly my own studies in psychology, but, but later on in some of the work we did around behavior change, uh, uh, recognizing that, that some of what had been um, suggested as the way of getting people to do things uh, as a physician were simply wrong. They were simply wrong. And that uh, it made much more sense just, just logically to work with people in a collaborative way, not to mention morally. And, uh, and um, we began to work, um, uh, you know, I worked with, with communities uh, that were quite different and people living in poverty when I lived in, in East, when I worked in East Van. And then when I worked with First Nations communities, initially with First Nations people in Vancouver in the early days of the, the, um, uh, the uh, NITEP program in, in education, first people came down and were trying to go to school at UBC and the kind of cultural uh, clashes that people were experiencing. I mean, I learned a lot from that. Uh, and I learned more when I worked with uh, the people in Haida Gwaii. I mean, I learned as much uh, and took away as much as I gave. Uh, there's absolutely no question. And one of the things that, that was evident was that um, um, and, and really crystallized in that experience working with, uh, with uh, Haida Gwaii was uh, that, I mean, they may, this sounds, sounds a bit trite, but that, that people do things for a reason that you know, people, people, even if they're psychotic, are operating consistently with what they understand to be the world. And, 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 and generally speaking, people do things because they've had prior experiences in their life that make them believe that they need to operate in a particular way. Um, again, it may sound a bit, a bit trite, but, um, but that suggests that if that's true, then the only way to proceed, if you're, if you see yourself as being a, um, a healthcare worker or a you know some kind of, of care provider 
is to always be in questioning mode, to be always thinking about what is it that makes this be the way it is. I mean, um, one of my early uh, 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 research projects was with uh, a fellow named Barry Cook, who was a United Church minister and also a psychologist. And Barry was working with us when I was early in family practice. And we did a series of tapes uh, on, um, on dealing with the difficult emotions. Uh, and we created an acronym and, you know, and the, the, the basic principle was that if somebody came in and they were angry or they were grief, showing grief or they were uh, whatever, I mean, particularly anger, um, that what you needed to do was acknowledge the feeling and then look for the source, you know, ASAP, acknowledge the feeling, look for the source of that feeling, and then try and agree on uh, some uh, understanding of what was going on and make a plan going forward. But the premise was that you didn't know, you had to ask. Uh, when I taught multicultural care, I mean, what students wanted was they wanted a book that listed you know, what should they do when they saw an Iranian patient or, a, or a, an Afghani patient or whatever. And what we, we said was, uh, uh, um, well, here are some things you might wanna know, but what you really need to know is how to ask the questions and to be humble enough to recognize that uh, in order to be helpful as a, as a coach, as a uh, shared decision maker, you needed to understand context. You needed to understand the story, it goes back to the story. If you don't know someone's story, you cannot provide care. And I believe that very strongly, which is why I believe so strongly also in a longitudinal model of care where you actually are in a relationship with a care provider, not necessarily a physician, but somebody who provides a trusted uh, source of access to care. It may be a nurse practitioner, it could be a community health representative in some cultures, but someone who knows your name, cares whether you as a person live or die, and uh, in that context, you know, there's a trust uh, that allows for, um, for example, um, someone to raise a question about which they're very troubled and to have enough confidence in the answer to be able to then relax and not need 600 tests to reassure them. Um, so that longitudinal model of care based on trust uh, that develops because people know each other's stories uh, and um, and try and stay in balance you know, re in, in relational care rather than hierarchical care is something that I've, I've really valued very strongly and tried to model not only in our medical education, but frankly, in the, in the way I ran a medical school. I mean, you know, it was it was um, for some people, it was it was a bit different from what they might have had experience with in the past. I mean, not to simplify what you said, but I mean, a lot of that, and I suppose in, in diagnosis too, is the, the extent to which uh, the astuteness of your listening, shall we say. And I, I wonder if you could say some more because, you know, I mean, you helped to establish with Elizabeth Why Not the Vancouver Sexual Assault Assessment Service, which I think has been extremely important. And, and in many ways, uh, of course, people weren't listened to who'd gone through that kind of uh, violence. Yeah, well, family violences and, and sexual assault are, are um, certainly um, um, models for where people have mm -hmm. been uh, poorly heard and poorly treated. You're right. I mean, in, in the, at the time when, when uh, Dr. Wynott and I were, again, we were these, these um, somewhat... Um, uh, suspect practitioners. I was at Reach. She was at Pine Clinic at the time. Um, later on, I mean, we they let us run the asylum, right? I mean, uh, she became the president of a hospital, and I was the dean of a medical school. So, but at that point, we were practitioners, and uh, and we became aware of um, some of the things that were happening for which there was very poor response in terms of our care system. And um, I, I can remember going to this workshop where she and I were both uh, um, listening to a presentation on sexual abuse. This was really early in our understanding of, of what was happening to children. And, uh, and I had come because of an experience I'd had with, with a, a case in my own practice with a, a child that even as I speak now, I, I have the image of this child in my, in my mind a child who'd been brought in who had uh, sexually transmitted disease. She had uh, gonorrhea. Uh, we, we cultured the thing, we found that. Well, at that time, uh, 
uh, the, the conventional teaching in the 1980s, in the early 1980s, was still that children got sexually transmitted diseases from contamination of objects like bed sheets or whatever. And so we, we were concerned about this child. We actually talked to social services, but basically there wasn't enough for anybody to go on. Child went home. Two years later, we saw the uh, younger sister of this child uh, presenting in much the same way. We discovered that there was uh, familial sexual abuse going on and the older child by then had actually run away from home. Mm -hmm. And uh, to this day, I feel, um, I don't know that guilt is the right word, but certainly I feel ashamed for the system that we didn't respond better. But out of that, you know, I went off to educate myself. And then when Liz and I realized that there were limited services available, we, we decided we could, set, we could make it better than it was. And so we partnered with uh, the police, with uh, uh, other physicians in the community, set up a, a 24 seven sexual assault service uh, for adults uh, and did child sexual abuse examinations with um, um, uh, social worker colleagues before the children's hospital then picked up uh, this and folded it into the to child abuse services and, and do an excellent job now for little for younger children. But we continued to run that, uh, that adult service. And again, I'm proud to say that the sexual assault program continues. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, you know, now again, people didn't, they meant well. Um, there was a, 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 a police pathologist who provided examinations for people where there was an allegation of rape. Uh, the, the situation was this, uh, uh, usually a woman, a young woman would be brought into the VGH emergency, put in a room, the door was closed and they, that person waited until the police pathologist could come and do the uh, sexual assault examination. There was no provision of social support or, or, or anything else. And it, there was just not, a, not good care. And, um, that was something that we were able to, to change with, um, with help from, from people within the community. Do you think attitudes have changed though? I mean, uh, I'm very interested in various, particularly French scholars um, who would essentially argue that misogyny is sort of deeply embedded in most cultural traditions and still seems to be present because um, you talked and, and have written about the disparities, particularly applying to women and new immigrants and also, of course, First Nations people, but seems to be a particular problem in, in terms of the understanding of, of women in this world as, as fully equal. Well, as a second wave feminist, um, I, I can only agree with you. I think that, I think we have a much more uh, nuanced understanding of gender and uh, identity um, uh, now than we did 25, 30 years ago. Nevertheless, uh, there is absolutely no question that in, you know, 80% of, of, of the world's women uh, uh, face um, gender discrimination as women. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and the issues around um, safety, I mean, you know, there isn't anybody here who hasn't been reading about what's going on in Afghanistan. Uh, 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 the fact that, that the world still looks like it looks uh, is, um, uh, is, a, is something that still gives me, makes me sad. I mean, um, you know, I've talked to women's studies students uh, who, who uh, you know, a few years ago, sort of when we talk about issues around um, uh, women's right to, to choose in terms of their um, uh, uh, when they became pregnant, uh, people would say, well, but we've already solved that problem. You know, that, that's not a problem anymore. Well, you know, it's 2021. Uh, we're watching uh, Wade versus Roe uh, being overturned in the United States, potentially. I mean, the issues continue. Uh, and yeah, I would have to say that I think that misogyny is, is built into many of our societies. Uh, and um, interestingly, I think that as we are looking at uh, different ways of defining and understanding gender, uh, it's perhaps going to help to overturn some of those stereotypes because you know people have to describe it differently as they uh, as we as we go forward. Yes, I mean you you also said some very interesting things about trying to deal with family violence and 
trying to understand it in a way that for some of us it might be difficult because we would, we would immediately see it in terms of more black and white, if you will, or positive and negative. I mean, can you say some more about that? Because I think it relates to your sense of trying to understand situations uh, before you come to any attempt to alleviate them. Well, one of the things about being a family doctor is that if you see people, if you're privileged to see people over generations, then it isn't so easy to, to look at the isolated individual and say, you know, at this point in time, I know this to be true. So what do I mean? Um, I had the experience of, of, you know, watching people grow up and, and become victims and become perpetrators and needing to understand what was the, the genesis of some of this. You, could, you needed to intervene with some of the behaviors because you need to protect people. But that doesn't mean that you have the um, uh, that you should be have such hubris as to think that these are all the bad guys and these are all the good guys. I mean, it's much more complex than that. And you know, I think that again, um, when when one is working with learners, people want certainty. They want to know, you know, what am I supposed to? Who are, who do we who do we prosecute? Who do we defend? And the thing is that in healthcare, we operate differently than in the criminal justice system uh, and or even in the, or in the police system. And that was one of the challenges as we began to evolve our protocols for dealing with, uh, with uh, fam victims and families uh, was to uh, be able to work with people in other uh, parts of the system and say, you know, can we modify how you might approach this because here's our understanding of what's going on. Uh, again, not to say you don't hold people responsible for their behavior, but that means that it's a different, it's a different intervention in terms of what you do about that. Intervention looks different if you can be more um, understanding of the complexity of the context. I mean, over time, I just became more and more, um, again, convinced of how complex our systems are. And, and my recent work, as you know, has been uh, around uh, health care and health and medical education, health education as complex systems. Um, I mean, if, if it was so simple as you just could do command and control, tell people what to do and they do it, you know, it isn't like that. It isn't like that in administration either. And again, I mean, I, I have worked in senior administration uh, in that, you know, being a dean is middle administration actually in, in, a, in a university, but, uh, but where you, you, know, you don't tell people what to do. You have to find ways of, of changing people's uh, attitudes and, and beliefs um, that uh, assume that there is more agency and, and it's a relational uh, a situation rather than uh, command and control. I, I mean, I, I, I'm not smart enough to lead my life one way in my personal life, one way in my practice life, one way in my administrative life, my research life. I've tried to be consistent in all of those areas in terms of uh, being values driven. And, and I, I think that having actually, again, leaders who will state their values and live by their values and defend themselves when they're, um, uh, when they're working what appears to be counter to those values is fundamentally important if we're going to have a more humane uh, system of healthcare and, and health education. Yes, we should, uh, we should probably move to the third, the third phrase I picked out was equity oriented healthcare, but perhaps in passing because you're talking about issues that I say perhaps too simply could be described as mindset. Uh, we talked a little bit about people who don't want to be vaccinated when, when before the introduction, but I mean also the whole problem of the opioid crisis, which I suppose does bear on people's sense of not belonging um, and, and so on. I, I, maybe you'd like just to say a couple of things about those two issues since they're so pressing at the moment. Well, let's talk about the opioid crisis, first of all, in the sense of, um, I mean, first of all, let's disabuse ourselves of the notion that it's somehow a, uh, an unanticipated surprising event, uh, which is what a crisis, I suppose, uh, means. Um, uh, this um, this has been evolving over time, uh, and uh, and and fundamentally, um, um, we aren't going to change outcomes if we don't acknowledge 
the humanity of the people that we're dealing with and that, that everybody has a right to live and that there are no disposable people. Uh, I've certainly been in, in conversations where the opposite has been advanced that, you know, that and the pandemic that, well, maybe the, you know, people are, are, um, that are uh, less worthy uh, are, uh, uh, can be, um, we don't need to provide care in the same way or whatever. Um, and we had the opportunity, a group of us had the opportunity to do an evaluation of the BC opioid strategy. And, uh, and again, I, I have tremendous admiration and respect for the people within government and government agencies who've been trying their best to make a difference. Uh, but but where when you go and talk to people in, in the community, and you know, I, I chaired a, a community advisory group with people who are uh, people living with, with um, substance abuse, people who've been addicted, people working on the front lines. And, uh, and across the board, I mean, people said, you know, the point's being missed here. Again, we need to be dealing with people as people. We need to understand the complexity of the situation and that this is not about uh, putting band-aids on at the far end. It's not about, you know, public health terms. We talked about uh, uh, making the mistake of, of thinking you're making a difference if you're pulling bodies out of the river. And you have to pull bodies out of the river faster and faster as more bodies get thrown in the river. But the real issue is, can you go up the river and stop them from throwing bodies off, off the bridge? Because that's how you make a difference. And it, it, it's kind of like that. I mean, I think that that uh, there are there are no simple solutions, but certainly working with uh, the system, uh, the complexity of the system, recognizing that people are dying because of dirty drugs, that they're dying because you know in in ways that, that could be prevented by changing the way in which drug, drugs are distributed. But that requires people to recognize that this is not a moral issue. There's actually a health issue. Um, I mean, on the question of vaccination. Um, I'm very troubled by people who remain uh, um, anti-vaxxers, uh, given what we've learned over certainly a year and a half. Um, but again, I don't think they're bad people. I think they are uh, uh, people who are misinformed. Uh, often it's been confused by other political uh, contexts, which makes people lack trust and so on. And certainly for some groups, I mean, you know, if you come from a, uh, part of society where your experience with authority has been the risk that you're going to get deported if you declare who you are, if you even sort of show up in a place where there's someone of authority, then you might be a little resistant to going and having a shot. And that would make a lot of sense to me. But, you know, this, the, the, uh, so the challenge is how do we make it safe for people? And do we recognize that there will be some people in any conversation, there are going to be some people who make a choice that's different from mine. And although I may be frustrated and I may not like it, my obligation is to provide care in spite of the fact they've made choices that are different than mine. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just the way it is. I mean, we don't control the universe. Um, uh, and, and as healthcare providers, um, and this is something that's actually, I think, fundamental. If you're public health, you're looking at the herd, you're looking at the population trying to provide care at the population level. If you're working as a clinician with individuals, with individual families, um, you know, you, you give it your best shot, you make, you try and give the best information, you make it possible for people to have the conversation more than once, but you must recognize people may make decisions that are different from yours. My obligation is to make sure that they've got the best possible basis on which to make those decisions, whether it's about uh, contraception or it's about vaccination or whatever. I mean, you know, this isn't the first time we've had conversations with people who resist vaccination. I mean, they're, you know, it's only the pandi the, the uh, coronavirus is is the most recent conversation. Uh, but um, those of us in practice have certainly seen this before. I'm, I'm, well, I, yeah. Sorry. It's interesting to watch people, though. Um, I mean, so what are we seeing right now? We're seeing, um, again, population level um, attempts to change people's behavior by doing things like putting in a vaccine certificate. As an individual, I'm actually reassured when I go into a restaurant and there's, I know that everybody's got a, a vaccine certificate, but but real reality is that, I mean, the basis of doing that, the reason for doing it is to try and convince more people to make them um, 
uh, miss feeling they're missing out if they don't go and have a vaccination. So, um, yeah. you know, that's the reason. Well, I, I think, you know, you, you, you mentioned that word complexity. And of course, you've done a great deal of work around a public health care policy. Um, very interesting work of, of trying to use large systems theory. So can I get you to talk about that? Uh, because alas, we've only got 10 more minutes before we have the questions. <laughs> well, I think that, that you know, as one uh, works in a system, it uh, becomes, you know, a system as complex as this, it's become more and more apparent to me again that, that uh, complexity theory describes reality better than any other kind of theory that I have come across uh, uh, in my career. Uh, and, and some years ago, I think many of us began to look at you know, if you see the, the uh, healthcare as a complex system, then you can look at, you know, how small changes can make big, big differences. And, and that, again, simplistic thinking about uh, cause and effect uh, simply doesn't work. Uh, and, and so there's been lots of, of, of work in this area. And, and um, I, I had the, the opportunity to work with a, a multidisciplinary team from, that was uh, both UBC and Western uh, led by nursing uh, colleagues at Western and, and at UBC uh, 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 and did some, some really interesting uh, projects um, in terms of developing uh, equity-oriented healthcare um, approaches and looking at whether uh, using some of those principles would change outcomes for people. And it, you know, it's very difficult to show a change in health outcomes in a short period of time. I mean, it, you know, they take years to show. But what we were able to show was certainly that people accessed care differently, that if you could provide uh, a, a, um, a system that allowed people to feel that they were safe, that they could get access to the care they needed and so on, that they'd be listened to, that uh, people who did not come forward before for care would come forward, and we've been able to, to you know, to to show that uh, with some some good outcome data. Years before, we actually uh, for, again the same colleague Liz Wynott and I were involved in setting up a program that continues to this day, which was the Shayway project down in, in, in East Vancouver. And Shayway was a project that was a uh, community partnership between a hospital and um, and people in the community to uh, deal with the fact that. Um, pregnant women who were using substances weren't coming for prenatal visits. Well, why weren't they coming for prenatal visits? Because it was 100% certain that if the people came for prenatal visits, their child would be apprehended. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I said before, people do things for a reason. People um, uh, were, once you could provide people with safety, with assurance that they'd get uh, a roof over their heads and some food, provide safe access to maternity care, Gee, they wanted to have good care for their pregnancies as well. Uh, so um, that that's a that's a kind of simple example, if you will, of thinking complexity and and doing the thing that is going to make the difference rather than doing what seems to be the thing that the institution believes to be the the, uh, the approach. Um, it, back in, at that time, uh, the approach was again apprehend baby at birth. Uh, uh, you know, a very punitive interventionist approach didn't work. So apart from anything else, I mean, you know, again, I've had children, You've, many of you have had children. The last time I could make anybody do anything by command and control was when my children were two. After two, <laughs> it was over. So, you know, uh, uh, you don't have to be uh, a, uh, you don't have to have a graduate degree. I think that just recognizing that, that humans make decisions um, much in a much better in a relational environment, uh, even complex decisions, even difficult decisions. And we can't cure everything simply. And we and and as caregivers, we have to live with the fact that we don't control most of the situation. We can nudge it, we can try and improve on it. Um, certainly in terms of human behavior change, gee, uh, uh, the uh, you know, I, if I if I think about complexity, I think again about experiences with patients who would come up to me years later, you know, after I'd seen them, sometimes they were no longer patients, and say, you know, doctor, it was what you said, what we had as a conversation at Christmas, you know, five years before, it made a difference. I changed my life because I stopped smoking, whatever it was. And I didn't remember what that 
exchange was. But what I could say to myself was, it sounds like the kind of exchange I would have had. Mm -hmm. And terrific, it was if it was empowering, if it was enabling. Um, because at the end of the day, it wasn't about my being successful. It was about the person, the institution, the organization being successful. And that's what participatory approaches say is that it's, you know, it's about education and action and you're a, you're a, a, a catalyst, a facilitator. Well, I suppose just in our last few minutes together, which has been marvelous in my view, um, how about just some more pondering about ongoing evolution in uh, medical training and, and public policy with particular respect, I think, to the achievement of your ideal, which is social justice in healthcare. Well, um, as you and I have discussed before, uh, I mean, again, I've been dean of a medical school, and I'm 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 very I'm very um, uh, knowledgeable about uh, medical education and making doctors. But if anybody still has the illusion that making more doctors is going to make the population healthier, let me disabuse you of that notion. It's just not true. Uh, it'll make it easier for you to get a, an appointment sooner. Whether that will make any difference to your health outcome is another question. But, but uh, I'm a strong proponent of uh, um, interdisciplinary and uh, care, uh, not multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. Actually, again, respecting the scopes of practice of the people that have different skill sets and realizing we can do things in many different ways, being clear on what the outcome's supposed to be, and then deciding on what how to approach that outcome. Uh, and when we developed the sexual assault program here, you know, we did it with women doctors. We had them available. We could do that. There were places then that had uh, programs that were operating with nurses. There were other programs that were operating with uh, with other kinds of healthcare personnel. You look at what is the problem, what's the outcome, how do you achieve that outcome best, and uh, and and it's very evident that respectful interdisciplinary practice allows us to cover many more bases. We can see more people, we can do better care. Uh, that's been well shown. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced of it. How we educate people to practice differently is still a bit of a conundrum. Uh, we've tried uh, for um, um, some time now. I mean, I had the opportunity in, in the early 2000s to give away a lot of money federally, a charity committee gave away a lot of money for a great set of pilot projects on interprofessional education. They really were great projects. Most of them died after the pilot stage. Uh, and uh, it remains the case that there are few examples of, of large system change around interdisciplinary education or practice. Lots of examples of small change, small places uh, or small examples. Uh, but, but our big challenge is how do we educate people in their professional training from the beginning, how they're going to be different in their practice, and then reinforce it when they get into practice settings. Um, many of us who are educators in family medicine have had the experience of people coming back after they've graduated and saying, you know, quite angry and saying, you told us we could practice in this way. You taught us to do this. We can't do it in the real world. You know, it, it's just not possible. So um, again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a uh, op optimistic, um, I'm, and I'm also a pragmatist. I do uh, believe that you can um, uh, change the system, uh, and it takes a long time, but you can change it. Uh, and uh, I, I'd like to believe that um, I've contributed to that, but probably the major contribution to change that you make uh, as an educator is you can train some people, you know, educate some students who continue the good fight and, and carry it on and do better than you. I mean, what's the greatest joy of being a graduate supervisor? It's when your graduate student has an idea that's beyond what you thought of yeah. and actually stretches beyond what you could have done. I mean, that is just glorious. That's the most fun of all. I see Judy Hall has, has asked me the question of women in medicine. And uh, I, I will yes. give the Carol Herbert aphorism is that, you know, uh, equality in medicine uh, will exist when um, there are so many women physicians, there are just as many uh, people doing bad things who are women physicians as there are men, and there are just as many good and so on. It's no longer about, about gender. Um, we actually have a lot of women physicians now. Um, um, I do think that uh, women physicians uh, have um, some different ways in which they practice. We, we know that, uh, and it has changed the way in which 
we teach and the way in which we, 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 we must provide um, opportunities for people to do their training because of the life cycle issues that are, occur for women. But, um, but I, I have to also say, again, I'm an optimist, but I'm also a little bit cynical. I think that peer pressure is so strong that um, no matter where people start, no matter how well-intentioned, no matter where they've come from, uh, psychologically, culturally, gender, whatever, um, um, some of them will do things that I wish they wouldn't do, and some of them will be fabulous. And I'm still not smart enough to be able to tell exactly which ones are going to be the problem from the beginning. Uh, <laughs> Mm. Well, I suppose we should move to questions. Um, um, so I don't know, is anybody uh, going to type in a question? Um, from Cedric Carter, we use the term family practice, but given current practice developments, for example, in clinical, um, I haven't got the rest of the question there, Cedric. Right, right. Well, I think I've got enough to know where he's, where he's coming from. <laughs> so, so the history of the terminology is interesting. So family practice, family medicine are terms that were developed in the 1960s, really. Uh, and they were a recognition, they were an attempt to rebrand what was then general practice uh, because of the kind of thing you alluded to before that, that general practitioners were seen as the default, they were seen as the people who weren't smart enough to, to go on to become specialists. And so uh, there were a, a number of, of um, uh, people writing philosophically who who defined the discipline as being more uh, looking at the the context and family context and so on. Um, in fact, there's currently quite an interesting debate amongst people who say we should go back to the old terminology, celebrate generalism, and call it general practice because there was never anything wrong with that term. The problem was how people uh, uh, viewed it and, and described it. Um, nevertheless, so. Um, the idea of family medicine, though, is that uh, you look at people in the context of the, the people they live with, family, uh, family in the very broadest sense. Uh, you think contextually, you think longitudinally, you think from cradle to grave, and, and you'll see any problem that comes in. I mean, that's, that's the sort of connotation. It isn't just whatever um, whatever you come in with today, I've actually got a broader agenda because I'm thinking uh, much more contextually. Uh, and uh, so I would argue that even if you're practicing in a walk-in clinic, that if you view the world from the perspective of family practice and you actually think about people in these way, then you will practice differently than if you didn't, that if you, if, you know, that if you um, simply were, um, uh, operating on the basis of, you know, you, you show me what you want today and I give you what you want and it's over. Uh, uh, but it, but it's, it's certainly challenging with the multiple um, ways of providing care to be uh, providing contextual care. And certainly with the, uh, uh, the uh, advent of, of uh, urgent care centers and the like, um, there are a lot of people who aren't getting good care. And what happens is people will often go uh, you know, if they have, they'll, they'll go and they'll get um, acute care because they have an earache at the end of the walk, the working day, they take their kid in to the local walking clinic. And then two days later, they go to the family doctor because they didn't really trust what was said before. So, you know, Michael Klein has just posted, uh, Osler said in the late 1860s, it's more important to know what patient has the disease than what disease uh, the patient has. And, and uh, that, that was true then, it remains true. I, I absolutely agree with you. So, you know, my, my, um, one of my children has argued that, uh, that I'm, um, uh, and I'm, it's not just me, but that I'm a social scientist in, in, in doctor's clothing. I think good doctors actually are, uh, have to be uh, educated as uh, in, you know, to have to see themselves as understanding the human condition and have to be educated to see the human condition or have to come in again with the attributes that allow them to understand the human condition. And then we can give them the medical knowledge. Mm. I'd much rather have somebody who comes in with the attitudes and beliefs that will, um, will serve them well, and then give them medical knowledge than have somebody who's really smart uh, academically, but doesn't have the values because it's real hard to change values in adults. Yes, that's true. Well, Lynn Smith, you asked a question. Did you see that, Carol? I didn't actually flash by. Can you, can you redo it? 
the, the question we had from Lynn. I think it was Lynn Smith, wasn't it? Yeah. I should you be type able to... it in again. May, oh, it... oh, typing it in would take longer than saying it, if I could just okay, say it. Okay, well, please say it. <laughs> okay, thank you. I brought you. it up on the chat, Lynn. I brought it up on the chat. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So the yeah. question is, um, sometimes the phys physician's values are not consistent with what the patient wants or needs, for example, in cases of abortion or assisted deaths. Could right. you comment on that? So mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's a fascinating uh, a dilemma, right? Uh, so individuals obviously have the right to their own values and their, their own uh, 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 um, uh, uh, ways of thinking about the world. But if you choose to be a healthcare provider, then in my view, you choose to ensure that your patient has full access to all of the uh, legally available uh, opportunities for their health in uh, that are there. Now, if I choose not to provide abortion services as a healthcare provider, then it is my obligation to ensure that the patient is directed to other places where they can access those services. That's good medical care. That's good medical practice. Um, does it always happen? No. Uh, uh, but, but I think that uh, um, um, it's our obligation in the educational establishment and certainly in our, in our colleges and so on that we ensure that people understand that that's the expectation. The expectation is to ensure that patients have access to medical care and to making the choices that the patient chooses to make, not that the doctor chooses to make. Maybe I'll stop with that. No, it's really, did you get you. The, the other questions we've had too now from Rosamond and from David? They, they come up for you, Carol. Rosamond, what do I think of a liberal arts education prior to medical school? Well, you know, um, um, I think there are many, many uh, routes, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to success. I, I have had uh, the, the, again, I've, I've, I've lived long enough to have moved from a time when you had to have a, a, a medical science background a bachelor of science or, or certainly uh, high marks in, in the sciences in order to get into medical care through a period where, you know, we had experiments with people coming in for all different backgrounds. One of the best students I ever had had a gold medal in music before they came to medical school. I mean, I think that um, I, I, um, I am really interested if I'm working in admissions in whether someone has been motivated to be successful in whatever their career path, they've been able to deal with obstructions. Like I would much rather actually have someone that's had some barriers and has had to deal with them. Has demonstrated their ability to go around those barriers to to find solutions to problems in their lives, whatever that might look like. Um, I'm much less inclined to worry about what their exact uh, what their their healthcare their uh, educational background is. Um, that being said, um, I think that there is a huge value in having a liberal arts education uh, in the sense that I think that people who've learned stories, who've studied uh, 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 the human condition are in a, a better place to understand the patient with the illness. Um, but I've met many people who've done sciences who are wonderful at doing that. And I've met people who've come to the liberal, liberal arts who aren't particularly good at that. So if I'm a medical educator, my challenge is how do I take you from where you are to where you need to be? Uh, I'm, I'm working with uh, people uh, in uh, an international medical school. I, I chair a board uh, where, as I mentioned before, uh, where we get students who, who sometimes need a boost because they've come from non-traditional backgrounds They've come from rural communities or whatever. We've developed a prep program. If, if people are bright, they, uh, they're, they're able to go through the prep program. They spend a few months. They're then uh, uh, on a, a footing that allows them to then learn the material they learn, need to learn to, uh, to master the, uh, the, uh, the academic uh, uh, material. Uh, so there are a variety of ways you can come in. But uh, but if you are going to do the sciences, then I'm, you know, if you come in with a science degree, I'm actually really interested in whether you've, you know, whether you've read, what, what was the last book you read? What, you know, what was the last film you saw? Um, uh, just as if you've come from a liberal arts background, I'm interested in your understanding of science and scientific principles. Are you scientifically 
literate? You know, do you have, are you numerate? Uh, I think that what we're, we're actually after in terms of people who are, who are afforded the, the privilege of uh, working with people around their health over their lifetime is we want people who are balanced enough in their own person that they're not playing out their own agendas with the patient. They're actually able to deal with their own issues, keep those boundaries clear, but be feel comfortable enough, again, understanding human condition enough to share um, their stories so that uh, they can provide the best coaching possible for people. Now, there was another question too, which is not up on my screen. Is it up on yours, Carol? Well, that's, that's the question of, um, from David Matheson. Ah, David, yes, you mentioned that large scale change is very difficult in healthcare. Do you have any suggestions where we should be going to move change along in an evidence-based way? Well, you know, we've written, we wrote a few years ago, wrote a paper on values-based leadership. And one of the things that we argued in that, in that, uh, in that paper and elsewhere was the, the need to actually have values-based values uh, based conversations with the groups that are coming together to try and make change and, and to try and find common ground uh, in the important areas that are going to drive the decisions that uh, lead to uh, whatever the outcome is you're looking for. Uh, and, and recognizing that people need to understand, people who are working in, in the system, whether it's the hospitals or the healthcare authorities, whatever, need to understand Again, how decision making occurs, how people change behavior, uh, not uh, to uh, um, uh, to think simplistically. I, I mean, one of the things we studied a couple of years ago was um, a, a well-intentioned attempt by the health of the the province to uh, within the health authorities to have people uh, develop um, pathways for um, for um, decision making around a number of conditions. They send out. I think 11 directives to all of the health authorities. And, and then they were surprised to find differential uptake across the health authorities of the directives. And that some people actually did different things that even were on the list of the directives that were sent out. Now, anybody, you know, and there are a number of people I'm looking at in the audience who know very well about how humans make decisions. Um, anybody who's, who understands how the, how the humans work would be would say well, well how did you not know that that would be the case i mean uh you, 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 the idea that you'd send out first of all 11 different things to do to people who are already fully ramped and working hard and told them to just layer that on i mean it's just, it was nuts it was a very easy study to do i will, will tell you we could have written the report before we did the study uh, but but if you sort of step back from that and say, okay, what's your outcome? What, what, what are you looking for? You're looking for evidence-based uh, practice. Could you not say to, to a group, you know, how would you, what is the problem you're, you're, you're dealing with? How would you see approaching this differently? Can we help you to make the change that you need to make? Um, and, and find leaders that could actually, actually champion that. I mean, there are principles of, of, of behavior change that allow you to uh, have things come out in the way you want to, much more likely than the command and control approach. Now I've got, <clears throat> yes, I know there are more questions. Robert Armstrong, government positions turnover rate is very high, so limited opportunity to learn health system. Any right. mechanisms to influence this turnover? Well, you know, um, Yes, government positions turn over very quickly. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things that one learns uh, if you're trying to get um, changes to occur in the system is that you have to have a message that's very clear and you have to keep repeating it every few months because of the changes that are occurring. You actually build that into the process. Um, um, I think that um, an understanding that the the, the administrators may be more important than the elected officials because they tend to be long stay. Uh, uh, I think that there are ways of, as, as Bob Armstrong well knows, of, of influencing the, the decision-making. I don't know about influencing the turnover. I think that um, the, uh, the advantage we have in some of our uh, working places, including the academy, is that we're long stay. And so again, um, it would seem to me that our opportunity and our responsibility is because we stay in the same place for a long time 
uh, that we have the opportunity to plan to help the uh, the the elected system, uh, the government system, to do things differently. We can we can be interveners, uh, and we have lots of examples of that. I mean, UBC has done that with uh, health policy very effectively. Um, so recognizing what we're able to do uh, because we're not on a cycle of election uh, and uh, or even of a reappointment as a as a uh, you know as a, a policy analyst or whatever, I think that um, that can be very very helpful. Tenure is a good thing in the sense that if we let people have the the uh, the uh, opportunity to to uh, fight the good fight over time, uh, it can be helpful. I really do believe that the academy has a responsibility, and certainly the medical schools and other healthcare professional schools have a huge responsibility around health, uh, um, because we we can do things that they can't do in government. Um, again, if you you know learning to work across systems for me, it was um, really really important to recognize the difference between what I could do, the difference between what my lawyer colleagues could do, what my police colleagues could do, what my government colleagues could do. Uh, and figuring out how we could combine our strengths and also understand each other's limitations rather than getting angry at each other, stepping back and being able to say, what's the outcome we're looking for? What are the values we're working by? And can we come at this another way? Because I, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's actually about the change we're trying to make. I mean, that's systems thinking, you know, simplistically put. Mm. Well, just waiting to see if there are any more questions. I mean, is there a deeper issue that you think about, which is the distribution of resources in terms of healthcare? Well, because you've done so much yeah. work around trying to deal with disparity and so on. So, um, I mean, the older I get, the more I worry about uh, inequitable distribution of resources. Healthcare resources are a very small component of of human resources or the resources that we provide for, for, for humans and for communities. Um, I mean, if we want to have a healthy community, what do we know? We know that uh, people having a living wage, people having um, a place to live, people having uh, access to healthy food, um, these things are all fundamental and making vaccinations. These are all things that have much more impact than what we do in the official healthcare system. Um, we do know that uh, that if you are going to set up a healthcare system, uh, that a, a, a robust primary care system, a way for people to access care for eighty percent of the problems that ail them, and 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 having this kind of con continuity of aspect, uh, will actually improve the health of the population. That's been well shown. Uh, Barbara Starfield many years ago published uh, from Johns Hopkins and demonstrated very very well in the American system that. Uh, that uh, it, you know, having robust primary care, uh, um, access to care at the front end uh, is much more important than anything else in terms of, again, the best care for the population. As an individual, obviously, if you have a heart attack, you wanna have the intensive care unit and all of those things available to you. And if you're lucky enough to live in a rich society, then you're, you're gonna have more likelihood than that accessible. But at a population level, um, um, the first thing to do is not to put in, you know, a very fancy um, hospital that does some um, uh, MRIs. I mean, you want to do other things if you're going to try and make your population healthy. And, and our medical students who are going to be working within the system and providing the actual medical care need to understand that larger context. They need to understand the limitations of what they do, and there need to be good citizens to make sure that they actually help to make for more equity of access to resources because they'll help their communities where they're practicing to be uh, healthier. And I think that you know our, our students who graduate are much better enabled to do that now than they were. Uh, you know, lots of people did it, but but I think we're actually systematically educating people much more uh, effectively to be able to be like that. And and we're seeing practitioners who who certainly take that as a larger responsibility. It's not to make them feel you know guilty because they can't solve the problems of world poverty but within their own community to look at how can they help to ensure better access to to resources in terms of the actual access to health care i mean I, I i will make a statement that i am strongly uh, uh 
uh, supportive and, and a proponent of the, uh, the medical care system, the, the public system in Canada. Um, I think we've got warts, we have to try and improve it, but, um, but I would much rather, I mean, I'm practicing, I practiced here when I had the opportunity to practice elsewhere because here when a patient came in, I didn't have to take a visa card before I saw them. And, uh, and I think that uh, most people are given you know, better care than they would have in most other situations. Um, even though, yeah, we're gonna have to wait in line. When I have to have my hip done, I'm gonna have to be waiting in line longer than in some other places. But if that means that all of us on this call are able to have our, our health assessed and our hips done in some fair way, that's better than the opposite. Yes. Well, um, I think one other qu uh, question that comes to mind, and I suspect by other people, is your reflections. You, you were dean at a very important um, school of medicine for a long time. Now, having been out of it for some time, what what might you think would be necessary changes that you weren't able to put forward, but which you might like to do now if you went back? Well, that's an interesting question. So, um, hmm. I mean, we were able to develop distributed education, uh, which was much more broadly based than, than, than previously. And I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we were able to do that. I think we were able to develop a different way of approaching research uh, that allowed for, again, a broader range at, and at the same time, focusing research in ways that were um, more um, um, utilizing resources most efficiently to get the best bang for the buck. Uh, so, but, you know, it's an interesting question. What would I do differently? Um, if I had the opportunity to start from scratch, then I would develop a medical school that didn't have departments. I would have two large catchments. I would not have individual departments for all the reasons that those of you that have run departments will understand. Um, I would, uh, I would um, hire, uh, uh, I would involve uh, interdisciplinary training from the beginning. Uh, not a question of bringing people in the same room and, you know, and so on, but, uh, but actually providing team teaching and clearly respectful role modeling from the beginning and, uh, and, uh, and I would make sure that I was working with my cl with clinical um, uh, uh, settings where, again, the idea of community-based care and partnership where um, the doctors in training understand that they're privileged to be there and they have a responsibility to the community. Um, I mean, I think there are components of this in many medical schools now or some medical schools, at least that's what I would wanna do. Uh, it's it's easier to do that if you're starting from scratch than it is when you're re you know uh, uh, redirecting the Titanic. We were able to make some changes because I'm I believe in the long haul and I can wait long a long time to see out, outcomes um, uh, and uh, and I'm satisfied with small changes. Uh, sometimes I recognize it's hard for change to occur. I I was okay, but it would sure be fun to be able to do a green field. Uh, Michael's asked the question: Why do you yes. think that? BC is the last province to embrace other ways of practicing than fee-for-service. Oh boy, <laughs> if I knew the answer to that. Um, but it's true, we have been very slow to, uh, you know, I, I mentioned more than 50 years ago, we developed models of care that were not fee-for-service that did a really good job in areas where we couldn't do a good job of fee-for-service. And uh, you know, when I was in Ontario, I mean, we were able to in invent family health teams and some other ways of providing uh, remuneration that made it possible for doctors to practice differently and to practice in partnership differently because it's really hard if you're only paid for you know for collars and cuffs and only if you yourself sew the collars and cuffs it's really hard to do it differently um i think that uh the um the organized systems of medicine in this province have, seem to have been really reluctant to uh to um help government to change, to provide alternatives for people. I think our, our learners, our graduates are actually going to demand that it be different. They're going to vote with their feet or they're going to demand that it be different and it, it will change over time. But it, it has been very slow in this province. 
you know, I, I thought that when I went to Ontario, it was going to be more difficult because there were multiple medical schools and they'd be all, they were all in competition. There were all lots of, lots of issues, but it was fascinating to me that, uh, that there was less resistance to some of these changes than I'd experienced in BC. And I'm, 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 I'm sad about that. I don't know, Michael, if you've got thoughts about, about that yourself before we finish. Michael, please, please come on. No, it's it's uh, it's as you say, it's a very tough uh, question. I think that uh, I think it has to do, and, and and this is a very simplistic answer, that that we relied very heavily on expatriate uh, people from Britain, many of whom were leaving the United Kingdom because they were unhappy with the uh, with the National Health Service. Many of those people then wound up being heads of the colleges of College of Physicians and Surgeons and our, our physician organization as well. As they have retired, I think there is more opportunity for, uh, for other models to you know, be, be applied, but it's going to require uh, a serious partnership uh, and study because, of course, we do have alternative payment schemes, but they are they almost uh, unless you're in a very remote rural community like Fraser Lake, where everybody's on salary, the, the docs, the nurse practitioner, and everybody else. But in in the major population centers, uh, you you know you have some community health clinics, but the dominant model is fee for service, and if you yep. want to. Uh, to practice in a uh, in a team, uh, if you wanted to hire a nurse practitioner, you'd have to pay the pay for it yourself, and yeah, uh, that's that's a huge deterrent. It's absolutely true, uh, but you know the the colonization of Canada by physicians who came from away um, is so across the country. It wasn't only here, and uh, 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 and yet there's been more rapid or at least not, I wouldn't call it rapid, but there's been more evolutionary change uh, in some jurisdictions and others. But, but I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, again, I think that the people that, that our challenge is to ensure that if we have, bring in people who are diverse for their education, then the people that come out are going to have a different way of looking at things and try not to make them into clones of who was there before, but rather recognize they're going to have different ideas and they're not going to be comfortable necessarily for the, the, the people that are going to see themselves as losing the status quo that where they enjoyed, um, uh, you know, the benefits. Uh, but, but it will change. I do believe it will change because I think that in order for us to do the best job we can with the resources available, we have to look at doing it differently. That being said, I mean, I've also seen very creative people running fee-for-service practices that uh, have done things over years. I mean, people up in Seashell for many years have, um, have done some fascinating things in spite of the remuneration system. So, so um, um, money makes a difference, but, but actually values and vision drive the thing first, then you figure out how to fund it. Well, I've hugely, as everybody else, I'm sure enjoyed hearing your wisdom, Carol. And can I bring the session to an end with a quote from you? Because I think it's a moving quote and um, means much to me. I consider my students and my children to be my most important contributions to the repair of the world and improved health care for all. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. This was a fun conversation. I think it was far ranging, not necessarily linear, but that's in, in, uh, in the context of, of systems thinking. So <laughs> Good. Thank you. Well, goodbye, everybody. And do join us again on the 9th of November with Pittman Potter. Thank you so much again, Carol.